Turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah 3, and we're, rather than read a passage today, I'm going to just touch on a few things through the first few chapters and focus in on chapter 3 just a little bit. During the 2004 presidential election campaign, family values was one of the primary issues. Does anybody remember that when there was a lot of talk about family values? Well, I guess nobody remembers it, but I do. And there was a lot of talk about it. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the Bush campaign. They were talking a lot about family values. And, and, I, and I think most of us agree that the family is the primary place that values are learned and practiced. The, you don't hear that talked about a whole lot anymore because it's been muddied up. Um, people have tried to redefine the family, what the family's supposed to look like. We hear criticism such as there's no longer the uh, leave it to beaver kind of family. And perhaps that's true to a point. But the scripture is clear that family is something to be valued. That fathers and mothers, husbands and wives and children have roles. The Bible teaches that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And there is such a thing as family values. And you don't have to be a researcher to come to the conclusion that Bad family values can lead to problems in the future. Bad family values can lead to problems in the future. The way the home is managed and the way values are practiced and lived out will affect the way the next generation lives life and does life. And so I think it's safe to say that that's not only true in the family, I think it's safe to say that our church is only as strong as the values of the families that make up our church. We're only as strong as you as families, as you are. We're no stronger because you make the church up. It's true of our nation. Our nation is only as strong as the families that make it up. And some would argue and even say that the reason our nation has some of the issues it does is because the family unit has broken down. I believe God cares about the family, don't you? I said God cares about the family. Well, values are something that we are. Values are who we are. They become infused into our spiritual DNA. Values are who we are. They exist in our spiritual core and not only become evident in our conversation, but are undeniably evident in the way we live. I've said this in leadership settings before, and I've said it with the staff. I've said it with others in leadership settings or in pastor's meetings when you look at the first three chapters of Nehemiah, it's important to understand that in the first four verses of chapter one, it has to do with burden, and burden is something that we feel. It's passion. It's the thing that causes you to go do something about it. It's the thing that moves you to pray. Burden is something that can yank a tear out of your eye. I don't know when the last time you've been burdened for something, but most of us don't carry that anymore. In fact, we even move away from burdens, but burdens in Scripture are not always bad. Burden becomes that internal passion that it's the fuel that moves you to get up and make another telephone call, to get out of the bed in the morning, to go do something about it. We all need burden, do we not? I said we need burden. Burden is what we, we feel. Vision is what we see. When you get past the first four verses of chapter one, you begin to see Nehemiah pray. And in the process of praying, the Lord begins to give him a vision of what God wants to do in the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is broken down and it's decayed and God wants the people to have a place to come back to, to where they can worship him. And so he gets a vision to build walls and to restore the city. Vision is what we see. Do you have a vision? Do you see anything? Do you see anything for your family? Do you see anything in your children? Do you see anything out in the future that they could become with God's help? Vision is what we see. Uh, mission is what we do. You get to chapter 2, verse 17, or excuse me, verse 14, and it says, the, they said, let us rise and build. Mission is what we do. Many of you may not articulate a mission, but what you do every day, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your free time, the way you manage your time determines really how you feel about your mission. Mission is what 
we do. And values, when you get to chapter 3, values are who we are. We just are who we are. We do what we do, and we are who we are. L listen to me. Don't, don't let me lose you here, but, but please hear me out. To do anything significant for God, please hear me. To do anything significant for God, and when you think of significance, I'm talking about doing what you need to do in your family to raise your family in the way they need to be raised. I'm talking about being part of a church that has a vision for the future. I'm talking about perhaps you may see the future for your business, some things you really want to see happen. Or in your personal life, let me just say this, to do anything significant for God, burden, vision, mission, and values will all interface and come together. Am I making any sense? Am I making any sense? What you do will move you as you see things in the future. You'll begin to get a burden for what you may need to do. Values who you are begins to interface with your mission and what you do. And God begins to do things through us. What I'm telling you is that not only is there for us on a church level or a national level or a, in, or a big company level. I'm telling you that that kind of thing is what we need to get a hold of in our families and understand that God wants to do great things in our household. Can you say praise the Lord? In fact, let's give him praise for the household and the family. It's a good thing. Something I've discovered as I was reading chapter 3 this week. I never really saw this clearly, but family values had to be in place for the walls of Jerusalem to be restored. Uh, the backdrop here is simple. The Jews are in exile. I want you to put their sandals on for a moment. Can you imagine losing this nation? Years and years and years have passed by. A place that you loved, perhaps it's Cleveland, Tennessee. And it ends up in absolute ruins. The infrastructure completely is destroyed. It's chaos. There's no order, no law, only devastation. It's hard to think of anything like that happening, but that's what happened here. The city, the holy city, the city that once was a beacon, a light to the world, had been destroyed and overran. And the people had been driven out and taken into exile. Years later, a man named Nehemiah, who's just a young guy who's serving as a cupbearer, every time the king calls for a glass, Nehemiah had to respond. Nehemiah. Happens to be in the right place at the right time, and he hears a right word, a word, a report that comes from Hakaliah and some brethren that had been to Jerusalem, and they come back, and they come into the king's palace, and they give a report to the king about how devastated Jerusalem is. Nehemiah, being a Jew, serving in the king's court is also devastated. The Bible says in verse 4 that he sat down and wept. This burden came upon him. He prayed and fasted. He became very burdened to the point that God, through prayer, gave him a vision. He had no resources, so in chapter 2, he, he acknowledges the king when he's in, he's in his presence one day, and the king asks him, what's going on, Nehemiah? And he began to unpack how he felt and the vision that he had. And Nehemiah decide, or excuse me, the king decides that he's going to bless Nehemiah and turn him loose with an opportunity to go do something about Jerusalem and its destruction. So in chapter 3, you find this massive effort of people who are mobilized, men and women, to go back to Jerusalem and restore what was once called the holy city. It's been called by many theologians, perhaps outside of the birth of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ and the resurrection, perhaps 
the greatest miracle of all of Scripture, one of the greatest miracles, probably equal to even that of the Exodus because of the massive amount of people that had to be mobilized because in 52 days, this city that was in ruins, I mean, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have computers, they didn't have technology, they didn't have equipment, they didn't have social media. In 52 days, masses of people were mobilized to restore the city of Jerusalem. And in 52 days, the people had a place to go back to to worship God. It was incredible. And we sit here in our context today, we can't understand that. We'd be in trouble if we had to restore this building, let alone a city. But they did it. In 52 days, and you get to chapter 3, and what I find there is it's loaded with values, values that reflect, reflected who we are. And let's be honest, at first glance, it'd be easy to want to skip chapter three because you read it and it's, it's got all these names and next to him is this family or this name and next to him and next to him. In fact, I, I don't want you to be distracted, but, but later just count how many next to hims is here. Next to him, they did this and they did that. And next to him, they did this and did that. And next to him was this family and they did this and this. And then the next to him was this man and his daughters and they did this and this and this. And it's all the way through the chapter. And at first glance, you want to say, Ugh, I'm going on to the next chapter. Be careful when you skip over Scripture. Because sometimes you can pass over some great stuff. And in it, you find these values. These values that describe who these people are. And it's led by fathers. Fathers who bring out sons. And, and it even says, I believe it's in verse 12 or 14 in chapter 3, that they even brought their daughters. Fathers whose values begin to take over. And we see these values get kicked into gear. And all of a sudden, things begin to happen. It's who they are. It's who they are. I think we have to ask the question, who are we? Who are we? Who are you as a father? Who are you as a family? Who are you? What are your deep values? What do you really embrace at the core, your spiritual core? Who are you? And is that connected in any way with what you claim your mission is the mission you have for your family or the mission you have as you do ministry, the mission you have as you do life, is these values interfaced with that at all? I would say to you that with many people today, they're very disconnected. People don't think that way anymore. We don't even really deal with the question of who are we. Well, these people had some substance. It was who they are that made all of this happen. Values are supposed to be who we are, things that we are purposed about, things that hit close to home. Now notice families, the family, how families required or repaired, I should say, sections of the wall that were close to their home. It was verse 12, Shalom, son of Halahash, uh, ruler of half district of Jerusalem, required the next section with the help of his daughters. Man, can you imagine asking our daughters today to get out on the wall and help us do construction? Moving right along really fast right here. Allow me to take this further and bring it up to date. Without right family values. This won't make you shout. This won't make you want to come to the altar. This won't make you want to fall out in the spirit. This may, may, will not make you want to go, yee It will not make you want to do any of that. But without the right values in this church family, we will never fulfill the vision that God has given this church. You will never fulfill it. And we talk about our burden and, and the younger generation and the older generation, intergenerational ministry in Malachi 4, 6, let the hearts of the fathers turn to the children and the hearts of the children turn to the fathers. The only reason that building got built out there is because somebody had a heart and there were some values to reach out to the next generation and make a difference in their life. That's the only reason it was built. Let's give the Lord praise for that value that we have about the generations. When you watch young people come to this stage or you watch young people on the video or you watch young people do music 
And you watch young people be involved and you watch our seniors get involved in what they do. And you watch them come to the stage on certain Sundays and you watch them get involved. It's all about intergener intentional intergenerational ministry. When you watch an assisted living center partnering with, with, with a businessman in our church, you watch that come together and you watch our young people get out there on the property and you watch young kids fishing in fishing ponds. It's all about generations coming together that we might grow the next generation to serve Christ and understand what it means to be part of a family. It's important to us. It's so, so important to us that we've spent a lot of money on that. Your values even ought to be reflected in the way you manage your budget. You say you're burdened for this or burdened for that, but does it show up in your budget? You know, sometimes there's a big disconnect with our worship and our values and how we spend our money. Is there an amen? Amen. It's supposed to be connected. Values. Who we are. Who we are. Westmore, we talk about values being gathered. The simple statement, gather and grow, give and go. What we call these four Gs. We gather on Sunday morning, not for our health. Listen to me. I can go make money. I hope I don't have to prove it because I'm called to do this, but I can go make money another way. I can go make money another way. I don't stand here in this pulpit because, just because of the paycheck. That's a wonderful thing because of, the, because of the time that it takes and what we do. And I'm grateful for that. But I don't stand here because of a paycheck. I can go make money another way. I could have made money years ago another way. So it's not about the money. It's about the calling of God. It's about the values that we possess that are deep in our heart. It's about this idea that we're supposed to be changing the world. We get behind fellowship of Christian athletes to do what they do. We get behind caring place. We get behind ministries across the sea so that we can make a difference in the world that we're in. It's about the values. Can somebody say amen? That's why we gather. That's why we're here. That's why we're here as a crowd this morning. Because gathering is a value. Giving's a value. Growing's a value. Growing in Christ, growing people, building people. You know, we get so confused about this sometimes. Everybody gets excited. We're going back to Jerusalem. We get some new walls. We get some new stuff. We get a new look. We get new tile. We get the latest, the latest technology. We get all of this stuff. But what God was all about was the people that were coming back to the city. It was about the people that were coming back to this great new restored place so that they would have a place to worship him. You see, God's, God's I'm sure he's thankful for buildings and we're all thankful for buildings, but it's about the people that are in the buildings, is it not? Is it not? So gather and grow, give and go. Now, without the immediate families embracing and practicing those values, our vision will never come to pass. Notice the four, very quickly, four Family values in chapter 3 that interfaced with this big vision to build a city, to restore the city, to have a place where the people can come back. Four values. The first one is very simple. These people gave. There was giving. Everybody say giving. Giving. And when you read through this book, you will find, yes, they gave finances. They did. Just as you do. And you give finances. It's probably a good place to say I thank you from the bottom of my heart, not because it's for me, but for the ministry that this church does. Thank you for your tithes and offerings and stewardship gifts and your missions offering. Those are the four things that we usually ask for during the year. A commitment to missions, a commitment to stewardship so that we can continue to develop what God's calling us to develop. And tithes and offerings to make it all work. I'm grateful for that, aren't you? Aren't you grateful for one another's giving? I'm grateful that I have a place to come to because of one another's giving. So giving is a value here. Some even mortgage their property. Now, nobody's asking you to do that, but here's some even mortgage their property. Interest was involved. They gave physical labor. They had sweat equity into this vision. They gave of themselves physically. They gave skills and talents and can I tell you, there's a big difference between uh, a skill and a talent. I should say a spiritual gift and a talent. There's a big difference between a spiritual gift and a talent. Let me give you an example. The Bible talks about 27 different spiritual gifts in the New Testament. 
You have, if you're a born-again believer, you carry a spiritual gift or some spiritual gifts that are in your life. Several of you, many of you, can identify those immediately. Others of you have no idea what pastor's talking about. But there's 27 gifts. Some would argue a little less. Some would argue a little more. We're not going to get hung up on that. There's gifts that are listed in Scripture. Some have the gifts of motivational gifts like helps and service and motivational gifts such as as, 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 as giving and hospitality. And we could talk about all those gifts. Some have ministry gifts that are very apostolic in nature or prophetic in nature or, or teachers or pastors or evangelists. Some of you have manifestational gifts. We believe that here. Tongues, interpretation, words of knowledge, gifts of healing. How many believe those gifts are real? Some of you carry those gifts and they reside in you. And they have to be exercised or affirmed and confirmed, not just because you confirm them, the body confirms them. Many people are into calling themselves, but that's not what this is about. The body, this is, 1 Corinthians 12 says, the body confirms that my members are members. You don't have to tell my nose it's a nose. At dinner time, I'll smell the food and I'll know it's a nose. It functions like a nose. Some of you are functioning in your gift and you don't even really understand it. But the idea here is that in chapter 3, gifts and skills and talents all came together. You know, we can have somebody here who has, I watched this last week as I went up and dedicated a building in Kentucky outside Madisonville. Ron Barker was there. Several of our men, Harry Dale, and some of our men, Lonnie Setlich, they were all involved. A team of our men went up and helped build that church. Build it from nothing. And if you could see where it's at, impoverished area. I mean, it's a mission field. Drug addiction, it's infested. The hill, it's, the church was built on, it's called Whiskey Hill because of the horrible past. There's been murders, out, it's out in the country, but there's been murders there in recent, recent years. Rough place. I went up to dedicate that building and here's what I realized happened. The skill of Ron Barker, the skill of, of, of the men that went, Harry Dale and Lonnie Setlich and others of our men that went, those skills got combined with the gifts of helps and service. Did you get that? Because you have a construction talent doesn't mean that that's a spiritual gift. Anybody can have a construction talent. But when that marries the gift of helps and service, now you've got a dynamic combination. That's why it's so important that people in our church discover what they're called by God to do. What are your gifts? Singing is not singing is not a spiritual gift that's mentioned in Scripture. It's mentioned in Scripture, but it's a talent. But when that talent is anointed and you give of yourself and you give your talent, suddenly we've got worship going on and we've got something that takes this congregation up as you lead us to the throne in worship. You see, we've got to figure out how to get our gifts and our talents and our skill sets all married together and the value of using our gifts for the Lord and giving our gifts for the Lord is used by Him. Can we give the Lord praise for gifts? Can we do that right now? That is good stuff. That is good stuff. Giving. Listen, without us giving and partnering together, the vision that God has given us will never happen. Never happen. The intergenerational vision we picture happening out in the church with the young and the old having a place to encourage one another, where we hear stories, where we can do things together, worship together, will never happen. Um, giving. Uh, second one is hard work. Fathers are designed to work. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Fathers are designed to work. Man will work by the sweat of his brow, Americans. It's a sad thing when you hear, and I've heard this different statistics, so I need to be very careful, but around 50% of our nation, people that are capable of getting up and going to work, about 50% of them do not work and choose to not work. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. You say, Pastor, you're getting ready to get on a soapbox. No. I'm talking about something that has great impact on our, on our families, on children, on our nation. Hard work is a value. I'm not saying that you have to go out and grab hammers and build walls. 
on the outskirts of Jerusalem. I am saying that you need to figure out how to make a living. And young people that are sitting here in our culture, you're told you're too young to work. Nonsense. That's nonsense. You will do yourself a great favor to start working now. It's one thing, and I don't mean to call any names out, but last year, I've, I've got to say it because I appreciate them so much. I've watched those three Allen boys when I'm out on the church property grabbing weed eaters. I've watched them work. I've watched them load and put equipment in the back of the trucks. And I've watched others of you too, but I've mentioned them because i watched it happen many times. Guys, I'm so proud of you for starting early. It will have great payoff and great ramifications. And I say that to any of you that are working. Working is spiritual. It's as spiritual as speaking in tongues. It's as spiritual as falling out in the spirit at Winterfest. It's a spirit of shouting hallelujah, yay, yay, yay. One of the most spiritual things you can do as a young man or a young woman is understand the value of hard work. Somebody give the Lord praise for the opportunity to work, to work for God and to work and to produce. You know, the scripture is filled with, I just want to read three quick verses. Psalm 104, verse 23. Man goes out to his work and his labor and to his labor until the evening. I need to be very careful here, but in some cases, and I need to be very careful because, listen to me, I have a right to say it. I was raised in union union country. My uncles will probably hear this on live stream and get mad at me. And unions may have a place, but they've also hurt our nation because we're told to work four hours a day instead of eight hours a day. That's nonsense. I had guys tell me as an 18-year-old working at Gerber Baby Food Products, slow down. You're going to make the rest of us look bad. In fact, the best thing you can do is fill that pallet and go crawl up in the back corner somewhere. They said that to me. I was trying to get the attention of of those that were over me in the Lord because I was taught that hard work will get you somewhere. And I was told that speed and working hard will get you. I was raised in that. Don't tell me it's not true. I've heard it over and over and over again. Where are we going? Where, what are we doing when our values shift? When when a week's worth of work comes down to 29 hours a week, Mr. President, you need your head examined. 40 hours of work is a real work week and more. In fact, the scripture says they work six out of seven days. A man was built to work. A man was built to work. (laughs) I know it's not politically correct, politically correct here. I just... I want to teach. you got to understand it. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.22, So I perceive that nothing is better than the man should rejoice in his own work. For that is his heritage. How will you ever have a heritage or leave your kid anything if you don't work? How will you leave anybody? You say, I don't care about that. Well, that's going to be rather obvious. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, watch this. Some translation says, if any man does not provide for his own household, he has denied the faith. It's attached to your faith. He's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I didn't say that. The Bible did. Take issue with the Scripture. Work has become redefined. It's become less valuable in our culture. Why work when government God will take care of me? What is that? Why work when I can have a cell phone, eat food, and go to two years of college free? Why work? Now, I know this is sensitive, but we are watching cultural shifts happen right before our eyes. And it's concerning. And I'm thankful for a father at 16 years of age. Actually, it was 15 years of age in the summer. He said, Cal, get a job. Get a job. In the summer, I was picking blueberries and hated every minute of it. I was picking strawberries. I was picking cucumbers. And you laugh, but those prickly things got all over my hands. I hated it. And my dad said, for you, you will work in the summer. When I hit the next year, when I turned 16, 
go to work and find a job and find a job because if you're going to buy a car, you're going to carry responsibility in having that car. He helped me out when I stumped my toe from time to time. He even signed the note, but he said, you'll work. And I know, I knew, I knew that I knew that if I stopped working and that car was taken from me, that's the last time he'd ever put his name on the dotted line. When I hit 18, I knew, he didn't have to tell me, that I needed to be thinking clearly about what I'm going to be doing in life. And then I needed to start praying and thinking about that because that was serious business. And I knew as much as my parents loved me, I was not going to be able to stay in the house until I was 27, 28 years old. That I was going to have to get out and find a way to make it on my own. They kicked me out of the nest. And if I, they didn't, but I, they, they would have. They kicked me out of the nest and said, you've got to make, listen to me. Listen to me, mom and dad. Somehow you've got to turn these kids loose and let them know that hard work is a spiritual thing. And it'll build something in their life. It'll build something in their life. You say, Pastor, you're real passionate about that. Yes, I want to save your life. I want you to have something at retirement. I don't want you to be dependent on government. Because you get dependent on government, they're going to tell you how to live. We love even the church, tax breaks and all this stuff. Every time you get a tax break up the road, just know there's going to be a cost to that. They're going to start demanding something or they'll pull the money out. That's the way it is with the schools right now. If you don't stop, if you don't do this, we'll take our money back. Who does government think that it is? Government is established by God and it's to be used by God, but it is not to invade our privacy. It is not, I better be careful here, but God help me right now. You have got to understand that we can make it on our own and we need to take advantage of every opportunity that God puts in front of us to do his business. Let's give the Lord praise for what he's called us to do. He has called us to do that. Work, tell your neighbor, work is spiritual. It's spiritual. I, I have to say this because I see it and I've touched on it in the past. And I'll get off it quick. Young ladies, please, please hear, Pastor. Be careful about a young man that will not work. And your daddy will pay for your car. And he'll find a way to tell you what you want to hear. And the next thing you know, he's telling you where to take him in the car your daddy paid for. And he's sitting over on the right side, telling you how to drive, telling you where to go telling you all the lovey-dovey stuff he wants you to hear, and you're going to be emotionally tied up with that and can't see, oh, Lord, help me right now. I've said it before. Kick him out of the car and tell him to come back and see you when he gets a job. He can't take care of you. He can't take care of you if he won't work. You say, bless God, I'll take care of myself. You'll find out when he marries you, he'll have your money too. He'll take you to the cleaners. Get your eyes open. Ask God to help you. Get spiritual counsel around yourself. And yes, your mom and dad may know something about it. Oh, pastor's in trouble. I know right now. Work. 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 Let's go to work. Let's count it spiritual. You can rest on Sunday. Amen? Work. Teamwork. I got to move quickly. Lord. Next to him is the language. How many times I've said it already. You see next to him, next to him, next to him, next to him. All the way through this chapter. I think it's 30 to 40 times. Next to him, next to him. Teamwork. Next to him. Language. Work, work together. Learn your roles. Learn your strengths. Learn your weaknesses early. And, 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 and use those next to him. Learn the value of roles and partnership. Not everybody is called to do jobs we aspire to. Some aspire to be the lead. We have to learn how to serve. I thank God for those times that I learned how to serve. I learned how to work. I learned how to understand teamwork. It's one of the values of band and athletics. You don't play in a band being a superstar by yourself. You understand the roles that everybody's playing, and together it makes a harmonious sound. It's the same way on a ball field. You have to understand your roles, or you're not going to be playing on the team very long. You'll be sitting on the bench. 
Because you have to understand rules. These people understood their skill set. And they in, infused that skill set into the vision. And they begin to work within the context of their skill set. And they accomplish something amazing and marvelous for the Lord. Listen to me. As a church, we can do it. In your family, in your home, if you understand your roles, we can do it. We can all do it, right? So teamwork and then servanthood and sacrifice. All of these values led to the fulfillment of a vision God had for his people. They served. They gave of themselves. They sacrificed. And sometimes to accomplish great things, you have to sacrifice. Not just hard work. You have to sacrifice other things. You have to make room for it. You have to give up something else that you can't have now, but you might have to have later. Does that make sense? Um, when you go shopping and you desire to have this brand name, you might want to wait because that brand name will sure be a lot better if you put it on hold and get it when you can afford it. I hope I'm making sense. It's sacrifice, learning self-sacrifice, learning how to serve and to be sacrificial. These values led to the fulfillment of a great vision that God had for his people. The exiled Jews would be able to have a safe city where they could live in freedom and worship him. It wasn't, it was never about building walls and roads and towers. It was always about the people that were coming back to the city. I want what I do to be significant. In my home, my personal finances, in my life, so that I can make it about my family, my church, people around me. Am I making any sense this morning? Values. Who are you? Who are you? Um, here's how you can tell, even on the issue of hard work. If I'd rather sit around and play video games eight hours a day than go out, there's nothing wrong with playing a video game. Nothing wrong with that. But if that's all I want to do, you're in trouble. Unless you can become such an expert at it that you can uh, make a living. That won't go too far with your parents, I'm sure. A lot of people have wished that. Learn to work. Learn to serve. Learn to sacrifice. Learn to give. Use these values and let the Lord build great things in your life.